connecting us to YouTube so we can start live and then I'll start talking. to YouTube so we can start live and we'll start talking. Okay, so here we go. All right. Good afternoon all, thank you for joining us today. My name is Mabel Colon and I'm the program manager of Truth, Peace, Stop Violence. Truth, Peace, Stop Violence and the Brown Youth Coalition are elated to present our team talk on how racial injustice impacts youth. I will begin the team talk by introducing our inspiring panelists, which will be followed by the panel discussion led by Marsha Pritt. After the discussion, we will have a Q&A session and with a resource slide that I highly encourage viewers to either screenshot or take a picture from their phones. Um, some quick housekeeping points. For our Zoom viewers, you will be able to ask questions in the Q&A chat box. We welcome your questions at any time during the panel discussion. We will get to as many questions as possible during the session. This team talk is also being live streamed on YouTube at United Way Broward. Thank you to all that are tuning in. Let's get right to it. This team talk would not be possible without the support of United Way of Broward County. United Way fights for the health, education, and financial stability of every person in our community. Overall, there are nearly 1,800 United Ways around the world in 40 countries and territories. The Truth Peace Without Violence program, also known as Truth Peace, is a bullying and violence prevention initiative in Broward County, Florida. Truth Peace is both a school-based and community-based program. It aims to educate, engage, inspire, and empower youth, youth to take action and bring about positive change for the purpose of preventing youth crime and violence and creating safe, healthy, and thriving environments for children and families. The Broward Youth Coalition widely known as BYC, focuses on mental health, promotion, and drug prevention. There are currently five BYC school-based clubs throughout Broward County. For the community-based BYC, students meet virtually with the United Way Commission on Behavioral Health and Drug Prevention on a monthly basis. Any middle or high school student that lives in Broward County is welcome to join. Truth, Peace, and BYC are United Way of Broward County initiatives. Now let's meet our panelists. Um, today we will have four youth panelists and we also have two officers, well, an officer and a sergeant from the city of Fort Lauderdale Depart Police Department. Our first panelist is Nicole Yedra. She is an 18 year old Afro-Latina who just graduated from Fort Lauderdale High School last month. She will be attending FAU this summer. Her career aspiration is to become a counselor. Nicole was very involved in her high school. She was among a lot of things, the president of the BYC club, president of Latinos in Action, president and founder of Flying No Friends, which is a club to help students with disabilities, the Student Government Association secretary, committee chair for the Harvest Drive, and a peer counselor. Most recently, she was the lead organizer for a sitting in Wilton Manors as a response to the George Floyd protests. One way she practices self-care is through what she calls first or last 15. Before going to bed or in the morning, when she wakes up, she will pray for five minutes, write in her journal for five minutes, and read a scripture to, or the word for five minutes. Second, we have Gabriella Carter. She graduated from Miramar High School in 2018, which she describes as the best school in Broward County. She is a rising junior at Princeton University, who intends to use her future degree in medical anthropology and certificates in values and public life in African American studies to better the world, perhaps through law. She understands the importance of youth empowerment, mentorship, and providing social and economic mobility via entrepreneurship. Between her presidency and Our Health Matters, a club dedicated to promoting Black women's holistic well being and co founding the Black Talent Pipeline Initiative which is a mentorship organization fostering relationships between alumni and undergraduates, it's really important that she finds time to care for herself through video journaling. 
She describes it as freeing and allows her to clear her head in order to focus on the various tasks at hand. Third, we have James Lee, our male uh, youth panelist. He is a 19-year-old Afro-Caribbean multidisciplinary artist who was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Growing up in South Florida, James Lee became interested in art making due to the prevalence of public art, namely graffiti and murals in his community. This love for art prompted James Lee to continue to pursue his artistic endeavors at Dillard High School's Visual and Performing Arts Magnet Program, where he also graduated from last month. James Lee will be attending the Rhode Island School of Design in pursuit of his bachelor's degree this upcoming fall. James Lee practices self-care through art making, painting, meditating, and watching Netflix. Our last youth panelist is Shanice McLover Lee. She is an 18-year-old community organizer and writer. Her commitment to social change has been shown through her writing, experience as a community organizer, and global recognition. She will be a first-year student at Howard University this upcoming fall. Her first best-selling book, Young Revolutionary, A Teen's Guide to Activism, was written to give people the confidence, tools, and resources to become impactful community organizers and leaders who create long-lasting change. Young Revolutionary has since become the tagline for a global movement of young people all over the world, speaking up and sparking change within their communities. Shanice practices self-care by reading, baking, and listening to podcasts. As mentioned earlier, we have Officer McCray and Sergeant Jacques from the City of Fort Lauderdale Police Department. Officer McCray has served with the department for six years. He is currently a member of their community engagement team. Sergeant Jack has been with the department for 31 years, and he is a sergeant of the department's community engagement team. Our moderator is Marsha Frith of the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL. ADL is a leading anti-hate organization founded in 1913 in response to an escalating climate, anti-Semitism, and bigotry. ADL's mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to, and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. ADL's mission has never wavered and remains relevant today. Among its efforts, ADL combats hate by exposing extremism, delivering anti-bias education and fighting hate online. ADL's ultimate goal is a world in which no group or individual suffers from bias, discrimination or hate. Marsha Fritz is the education director for ADL Florida where she oversees the implementation of the No Place for Hate initiative, anti-bias training and other educational programming in support of inclusivity. Prior to joining ADL, Marsha worked at the New York City headquarters for the Institute of International Education, a nonprofit educational and cultural exchange organization. There she directed Fulbright scholarship programs for 400 international professionals and students, including partnering with higher education institutions on student orientation and cultural adjustment. Marsha also directed the overarching Fulbright Foreign Student Program, which supports programs for 4,000 international students. She has her master's degree from Brooklyn College in England. So I'm now gonna pass the mic over to Marsha who will lead today's discussion. Thank you, Mabel, and thank you for that introduction. I'm happy to be here, happy to welcome all of the panelists. So um, all of us are still coping with COVID-19, including all of you on the panel, and we probably all thought that this virus would be the focus of our thoughts. However, that changed on Memorial Day of this year with the murder of George Floyd. And so we are having this discussion um, to address issues of racism, racial injustice, and also to, to try and um, give teens direction and how they can cope. So it's been a little over five weeks um, since the world witnessed the horrific murder of George Floyd and protests erupted in 140 cities in all 50 states across and also across the globe. Can you talk a little bit about how you felt um, and what you did when you heard or when you saw the killing of George Floyd? Um, and when you saw protests erupt across the US and across the globe, who did you most lean on? You know, what did you do to try and process what happened? Um, let's start with, um, I'm gonna start with you, Gabriella. Okay, so 
When I first heard about um, the horrific murder of George Floyd, I was definitely distraught, but not at all surprised. Um, it just really took me back to how exasperated I felt when I first heard about um, Sandra Bland being killed, Breonna Taylor being killed, and just, it really made me realize how police brutality definitely is a big issue that's affecting the Black community disproportionately, but it really just, um, like brought it to my attention how gendered the conversation has become and how a lot of the time black women's experiences with police violence doesn't get as much out like uproar or attention. And that really made me feel um, like just really sad and disheartened. But also I didn't really know what to do because it's like state sanctioned violence has been something that's been afflicting our community for centuries. This is not anything new. And just the fact that we have like phones to record what's going on doesn't mean that this hasn't been happening before. And like, we don't necessarily have to experience physical violence by the state in order to be impacted by it. Like, it just made me realize how police violence is definitely connected to other forms of violence that the black community faces, such as like environmental racism, racial profiling, and over surveillance of black communities. And it really made me fear for everybody in my life because majority of the people that I do know and um, care about are black. And the fact that this could have been really anybody um, definitely didn't settle, sit right with my spirit. Um, and at first I tried to like, just continue moving on, continue working, continue trying to be productive. But I realized that I had to be a lot more graceful to myself. And the only reason I really realized that was because as I was talking to other Black people, especially the community of Black women that I've found on Princeton's campus, I realized that I wasn't alone in the feelings of like not being able to do anything, um, just feeling like really unproductive and feeling very just like there was a large cloud hanging over me. Um, and sharing those feelings, vocalizing those feelings with other people who I didn't necessarily have to explain my humanity to was really affirming. Um, and then we also got to talking about the protests and how it's really interesting because this is not anything new. Black people especially have been protesting for years um, and way before the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's interesting that we have this health pandemic with COVID and then this racial pandemic um, happening at the same time. And I feel like that's why it has festered up and become as big as it has been. So it's really sad that it has to come at a time when everybody is extra vulnerable, but it was definitely necessary. And I'm glad that the Black Lives Matter movement is getting the attention that it deserves too. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, does anyone wanna add on sort of what their experience was and who they were able to sort of lean on and turn to, to try and process this? Um, Shadice, are you interested in telling us a little bit about your experience? Um, so- I have, yeah. I have one question. Can I ask her a question, Gabriella, a question? Sure, Sergeant, go ahead. Yeah. When she said that um, we went from a COVID-19 pandemic to a, um, I don't know if she used institutionalized or she went to another uh, police, she used brutality or whatever, pandemic. This you realize that's a little strong because <laughs> I mean, when you say a pandemic, you saw how many people were affected by COVID-19. Um, you know, I don't, you know, condone any of, of the behaviors of the officers that were uh, in, in Minneapolis, but I don't think it's a pandemic. <laughs> I, I don't want it to um, come across like that because 90%, 95% of the cops are good cops. Uh, you, we just have to continue to get rid of the bad apples. And I don't want you to feel that it's a pandemic. And I, I don't know if Johnny wants to add on that, you know, make a comment about that, well, but it's let's, not. Yeah. I know, I know it, it, it comes across that way. I know it may, you know, be the, the biggest thing on the news, which makes it seem like that. But we weren't, you know, everybody wasn't getting beat up by the cops. This just was another incident that needed to be dealt with directly. And 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 you you look over the last four months, you know, from February to June, there were some incidents that were just horrific. Um, 
Sergeant, I, just one second. I want to make sure that we allow everyone to speak. Um, okay. So I, I mentioned Shanice. So I want to make sure that she's able to, to speak, James Lee, and then I'll go to you. Oh, no problem. I was, I was just addressing the last person that talked. Mm -hmm. Don't, listen, sure. run sure. your show. <laughs> sure. Shanice. Hi. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, like Gabriella said, I agree with everything that she said. It's interesting how we're dealing with a global pandemic and then we're dealing with the pandemic from 1619 since the time that first the first enslaved Africans arrived on this nation's soil. And I think it's very interesting how Black people are being disproportionately affected in both of those pandemics because a pandemic is, I feel like, the appropriate term to describe the history of racial um, injustices that have been occurring for hundreds of years because it is a long lasting effect. It's still negatively affecting black people. Like it is, I feel an appropriate term regardless of, you know, how she used it. But I did not watch the video of George Floyd being murdered. I stopped watching videos of black people being murdered by police years ago because that's not good for our mental health. Um, it's not good to ingest so much trauma, but at the same time, I'm present with the pain that it, what it feels like to always see so many traumatic things happening on a daily basis, but I'm also present with the possibilities of what this moment is creating and what it's like to see a moment in time become a global movement. Like you said, that's happening all over the country and all over the world. Thank you, Shanice. James Lee? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for um, you know, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to say that I do agree with Gabrielle as well. And I do believe that the term that she used, pandemic, is appropriate because something that we don't realize is that though you, something that we don't realize is that police brutality has been going on for a very long time. And whether you want, whatever way you want to put it on, good apples, bad apples, I don't really care because I believe that the policing system as a whole has perpetuated violence against Black people. And so the example that I bring to you is during the 1960s when civil rights activists were being were being attacked, brutalized, and hosed down by police officers. Were they bad apples then or were they just doing their jobs? And so I need you to consider that although yes, you may see police officers, you may see some police officers as bad apples and you may see some police officers as doing their job rightfully so and justly, I want you to also recognize that you don't just, I want you to also recognize that if a system is broken, you don't say that one part is broken, you fix the whole system you repair the whole system or you t or you or you buy a new system if it's broken and so i want you to recognize that yes there are police officers that aren't killing individuals and there are police officers that aren't perpetuating police brutality however when the occurrence becomes so often and that we are so, we are presented with this information we're presented with videos so often the police killing black people you have to then in question is this just bad apples or is the system working as it intended to let me, I, I want to make sure that I have, Nicole, I want to ask, make sure that you respond, but I also want to make sure that I have given an opportunity to Officer McCray and Sergeant um, Jacques. Uh, but let me uh, sort of make a suggestion in terms of, you know, how we're all responding to questions. Um, I think it's important for people to, you know, honor people's uh, choice, choices in terms of how they're responding to questions. And, um, I think it's better for everyone that you have an opportunity to voice your, your opinion and maybe not take issue with, you know, someone else's opinion. It's really important that we're all willing um, to hear from each other. So, but I want to give you an opportunity, um, Sergeant Dr. Officer McCray, I'm not sure which one of you um, would like to sort of respond, but I want to make sure you have an opportunity to do that. I mean, did Johnny, if you want to take that. Yeah, um, I, I'm not going to get into the wordplay as to, you know, how to define pandemic because we all have definitions um, when it comes to words and words aren't nothing without context. But I will say that I agree um, with both sides. I, I think that um, police brutality has been a widespread issue for many years. Um, you can even look back to the history of policing and what it was, what, why it started, um, what the purpose of policing um, but I also agree with Sergeant Jackson that, you know, I think that oftentimes police officers are, are grouped into the same category. We're grouped into the same boat um, as, you know, I don't like police rather than I don't like some police or police officers 
are bad and brutalize people rather than some police officers brutalize um, people and are bad people. So, I mean, I, I totally agree with Gabriella and that this is an issue that we have to we have to fight. Um, this is an issue and, and I'm optimistic because I see changes occurring um, within police departments. I see policies being reviewed. I see policies being changed. Um, but I also agree with Sergeant Johnson that, you know, and I can I can speak personally for myself. I have been verbally attacked and, and prejudged just because of this badge um, that I have on my chest and this patch that I have on my shoulder. Um, and that person may not have even known me. They don't know the person that I am, the human being that I am. So totally agree with both sides. Nicole, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share your experience if you would like. Um, I, my experience when I found out about um, what happened, I was very distraught and heartbroken. I wasn't surprised, but I can say that I do agree with my other panelists that this is a very big problem. Um, I'm not going to say that. I think we all have to learn how to come together and address the issue without hurting and making other people feel bad. Um, I think police brutality is an issue. It's not, I'm not going to say it's all of them, but I think it is an issue. I think accountability is very important. Um, we have to begin to talk about it in a way where we can address the situation. Um, but I do agree with my other panelists that this is, it is a police brutality and racial injustice and racism is a pandemic. Thank you, Nicole. So, I mean, definitely, you know, um, we see that the youth on the panel um, have a perspective when it comes to um, law enforcement. And I wanna ask a question related to that. Um, one of the things that happened, or at least that I noticed as uh, there were me there was media coverage of the George Floyd story and then subsequent stories like Breonna Taylor and ah Ahmed Aubrey is that black parents in particular, but parents of color, but black parents in particular came forward and shared that they had the what they called the talk with their children about how to avoid um, violent or dangerous encounters with law enforcement. Um, that was a phenomenon that I noticed. Um, obviously, you know, I am black, so that's happened in my family, but I'm curious about all of you. Um, and I would include, you know, Officer McCray and, and, and um, Sergeant Jacques in this question. Uh, did your parents have, you know, the talk with you about, you know, how to avoid a dangerous encounter and specifically with law enforcement? And what did you think? And how did you handle it? And if your parents did not have that talk with you, were you aware that other kids of color were getting, you know, this advice? So, you know, um, I, I can answer that. I mean, did you, were you, were you finished? You can go ahead. Yeah. I, I, yes, I got that, you know, conversation, but, but the other side of that is things when I was growing up were just a little different. My parents saw it differently. You know, my my mother was from the Turks and Caicos Islands, and my dad was from Haiti. So, you know, their their outlook on lawlessness um, or anything like that, you know, with the police, it was a total respect thing. Um, but as I got older, I, I, you know, they told me, hey, you know, you're never going to win curbside justice. So, <laughs> if, if there's a problem excuse me, uh, be respectful. And, you know, tomorrow you can make the complaint, you know, but don't think you're going to get any curbside justice arguing a point. And I kind of, I, I didn't understand that then, but I, as I got older, I understood it and they were right. Now, none of my family was in, 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 in law enforcement until my sister got in law enforcement. And then, you know, my sister's in law enforcement, my brother-in-law's in law enforcement, I'm in law enforcement, my other brother-in-law in law enforcement. So it was an interesting statement they gave us, not knowing any of us was going to
So Sergeant Jacques' camera seemed to freeze. Uh, when he comes back, I'll let him finish. Um, but let's let one of the youth on the panel um, give a response. So, uh, James Lee. Um, yeah, so for me, you know, there was never one talk. There has always been the talk. And so from, since the time that I was little, I just remember that my parents always being mind, cautious and mindful to tell me that stay as far away from the police as possible. And, you know, whether that being because they recognize that police officers may have, you know, police officers may be violent or that they recognize that wherever the police are, there's somewhere soon to follow. There's trouble soon to follow in that sense. So, you know, just growing up is, it's been several conversations and, there's been, and there has been several talks about ins ensuring my safety and what happens if I were to ever be in a situation where a police officer needed to get involved. And so, you know, my parents did the best that they could to ensure that I had the knowledge to articulate myself and I had the knowledge to de-escalate the situation as best as possible. But I also want, I also want people to recognize that even in moments where I may be doing my best to de-escalate the situation or where I may be doing my best to be as respectful or as calm as possible, there's always this level of anxiety and nervousness whenever a police officer is around, whatever the situation may be. Just because I know that so often we are presented, it's we are presented with the fact that, you know, things may go awry. And in a in a in a when I'm in a position to when I'm in a position to speak to a police officers, I don't I don't often feel protected. In fact, I feel fearful of my own life because in that situation I feel defenseless because I recognize that police officers are oftentimes armed and whatever the situation may be, if something, if I say something ill or if I say something that they may not agree with, you know, in this, in the circumstance, I, the situation may escalate and I won't have any means to defend myself, whether it, whether I run or, you know, whether I try to handle the situation peacefully, I know that I'm in a defenseless state and I don't often feel protected. I, I really truthfully, honestly feel fear for my life whenever, whenever I have an encounter with a police officer. And so, you know, when my parents do have the conversations with me, they just ensure that I stay as far police up with, with, from police officers as possible because they know that they recognize that these fears are, are prevalent and they have the same, and they have these same emotion, the emotions. Um, can I ask, uh, I wanna make sure I get some other youth to speak, but I, uh, Officer McCray, can I ask you directly, um, you know, given James Lee's response, what do you say to youth who feel fearful um, when they see police officers or they have encounters with police officers, but uh, what advice would you give them? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, well, James said that he had his, his parents had that conversation with them. And I, I don't know if the other youth, um, their parents have had that conversation with them. I think that it is actually imp imperative um, that parents have that proverbial talk with their kids. Um, you know, my family had it with me. My father had it with me, my family. And I think that those conversations were invaluable because they taught me how to interact um, when and if I get got stopped by police. And, and you talk about dangerous encounters. I'll tell you this, police brutality is real. It's a real thing. It, it's not a made up term, but I think that the media and social media, um, they perpetuate the narrative and the, the negatives more than what actually happens in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I'm saying compared to the positives that are happening and they have a job to do and they do report it, but I think that they kind of magnify it um, compared to the positive things that, that are happening. But police brutality is very real and I don't dismiss that at all. And because it's real, I think that the most important um, topic when it comes to that talk that you talk about is that parents um, emphasize to their kids to just comply um, at the end of the day, just comply. Um, you know, even if it's an officer who is, as youth like to say, doing the most or, you know, he's he's acting unfairly or his actions um, are, are, you know, going above and beyond what he's called to do. I think that it's important that that we comply. And that's what um, that's what my parents taught me. And, and, it, and it was very helpful um, the first couple of times that I got stopped by police. Because at the end of the day, like Sergeant Jock said, um, you know, you have to make sure that you make it home at the end of the day and and you're not going to win that battle out in the streets if you get that officer who does the most 
Um, so so it's, impor it's important that you know at the end of the day that you have different avenues that you can take, such as internal, affair, internal affairs um, to file those complaints, but it's not the right venue or setting to do it right then and there when you're with that police officer. Um, thank you, Officer McCray. Gabriella, Shanice, uh, Nicole, um, I want to make sure if you have anything to say that I'm able to allow you to speak before we move on to the next question, is one of you really dying to say something? Well, I guess I can speak because um, I come from a Caribbean household, but I grew up in London and I moved to America when I was 11. Um, and being a Black person or a Black Caribbean person um, is very similar, but also very different than identifying as an African-American person. And the history of policing, the history of slavery, like as it's specific to America makes being black or being read as black or perceived as black in America, a very different experience. Um, so my parents grew up in Jamaica and they understood themselves as Jamaican. And then it's not to say that they didn't understand themselves as black, but understanding yourself as a Caribbean person is, as I said, very different than understanding yourself as an African-American person. So I grew up more or less as an African-American person. So my, encounters with race or how I understand myself is very different than my parents. And the way that we had these conversations actually, I would say ended up becoming like, the conversations were more retroactive as I would tell them instances that I had with police or like whether it's police on campus, police at my high school, whenever I got pulled over or the things that were happening to my friends and we would end up having this conversation um, where they would kind of understand how being black is Amer in America or being understood as black in America is very different than being understood as a black Caribbean person. And it was a lot of mutual learning for us. Um, but I feel like at the end of the day, there is no like number of conversations that you can have that can prepare you for the fear that you're going to feel in that situation as a black person encountering law enforcement. And that just goes back to generational trauma because of years and years and years of various ways like the state sanctions violence against our bodies so of course like through those conversations they let me know oh yes like this is what you should do and we just have your safety in mind at first and of course everybody believes that there are going to be good apples or whatever but when it's my life at stake i'm not going to bank on somebody else just like maybe they're going to be the exception that like sees me as a valid and as a human person um so at the end of the day like there's no number of conversations that are really going to prepare your black child to experience like experience the amount of powerlessness and fear and just utter like confusion that they're going to feel when they come into contact with law enforcement one question i want can to I, ask can, can i ask um, her a question um is it possible for us to hold that for one second i yeah, want to yeah, no, no problem yeah I, I guess, you know, because we're, we're talking a lot about sort of, you know, experiences and um, perceptions and perceptions that are being debated about what is and is not true and accurate. I think I'm interested in hearing about um, solutions. Um, and I, I would love to hear thoughts on what all of you on the panel think some solutions might be. Um, you know, if we start with the notion of just perception, if we start with the fact that you have young people like you all who have fears and concerns about law enforcement, um, do you feel that there's an issue of police brutality? Um, and then you have law enforcement who are saying not everyone, you know, is a bad apple. There's just a few what do what do you think? I'd love to hear from all of the panelists on this. What do you think some solutions are when it comes to this feeling and this sentiment about um, law enforcement? So, um, Shanice, you were going to speak. You can make your comment, but also I'd like for you to respond to that question. Um, I'm going to respond to the first question. I'll let someone else respond to the question that you just asked, but. Um, I think we are beyond respectability, respectability politics and telling Black people who are constantly facing police brutality that we just need to respect police officers and comply because 
we know that like regardless of if we are respectful or not respectful like our lives are at risk because like just a few weeks ago Breonna Taylor was sleeping Ahmaud Aubrey was jogging so like you can literally just be existing and we are still brutalized so I don't like think it's just as simple as always complying because we do that and we see that that doesn't always work and I you know I um, have the same symptoms as what James Lee and Gabriella said, like, I feel a level of fear, like, I've never felt safe around police officers. The institution of policing itself does not make me feel safe. What makes me feel safe are knowing that the people in my community are good, that I'm, you know, I'm good, that I have someone to lean on, but, like, I like would not, if I was in a situation, like, I wouldn't feel compelled to even call the police because I've just seen too many instances of people calling the police and then it escalates and it results in death. And that just like, my anxiety is just like way too high for me to put myself in a situation to where I know if I call them, like what if something bad happens? Um, Nicole, I wanna make sure you have an opportunity. Um, in regards to the first question, I think for me, it's a very different experience coming from a Latin background. Um, in America, I think when it comes to like the Latinx community, it isn't talking about what to do in that encounter is very much pushed under the under the rug. There's a lot of um, anti-blackness within our community. So a lot of people, they don't really even address those situations. Um, I think we need to start humanizing those that are dehumanized in society and having a conversation on like you said, on how, what the solution should be. Um, I can't say that I have, on regards to the second question, I can't say that I have the perfect answer, but I think the first thing is education starts at home. Um, parents need to educate their children from the earliest age and the black community is doing that. Um, you see like all the other panelist speakers said they have those conversations. I never had that conversation with my parents. It was always just respect the police, comply, comply, comply. I didn't even know what police brutality was until later on in middle school. So I think that's the, the very first step is all communities needing to talk to their kids about social injustices. I think the next step on a broader scale is having more reform for um, police and having more diversity training and having them understand that there is ways to de-escalate a situation without having to pull that trigger. I know it's not, I know when it comes on, I'm not a police and I can't speak on what that experience may be like, but a lot of times you see when things happen, the answer is always, well, I felt unsafe and my life is first in a situation like that. And I 100% get that, but I feel like there ha there's so many other ways to de escalate a situation before it gets to that point. I also feel like another thing is if it does happen, things like George Floyd and all the other countless cases that do happen, it shouldn't you it it shouldn't have to take so long for those police officers to be held accountable or be brought into custody or questioned or any of those types of things. It shouldn't take that long. With George Floyd, we saw, or with Ahmaud Aubrey, we saw that it happened earlier on this year, but it took it become getting into mass media and we took it took social media and people really and people making an uproar for them to take account for um, those people to be held accountable. So or at least start to be held accountable. So we need to start seeing these police um, that are doing these um, that are making these tragic mistakes or doing what it is that they're doing that's not okay. They need to be start holding being accountable. Um, that's definitely part of the solution. I'm not gonna say it's the entire solution. I think empathy is a big thing. I think if you, you people need to start realizing their own biases. If you are a person and you are, and you feel a certain type of way about any community, especially the black community in general, you need to start realizing where that, come from, where that comes from and talking to yourself about it. Um, we in the community, I know for the Latinx community, um, need to start addressing our anti-blackness a lot more having conversations about it and starting to create, be part of the solution and not just a part of the problem. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you also, Shanice. Um, so 
we have only a few minutes left in this portion of the program, but I want to make sure that we cover um, the work that all of you youth are doing. Um, and then, um, well, actually, maybe Officer McRae or um, Sergeant Jacques, if you can spend just one minute with any last comments you'd like to make, um, I'd like to give the youth an opportunity to talk about their work, um, which is positively in impacting their communities. Um, I would just, Colton, I would just say to the oh. youth, can you hear me? Yes. Just continue to use your voice. Um, you have it for a reason. Continue to educate yourself. I'm very impressed by everyone that I met here today on this call. Um, continue to speak your truth to others because at the end of the day, you're enlightening others. Um, oftentimes in America and everywhere around the world, you know, people often look at things through the lens that they have experienced. And if they haven't experienced it, then they act as if it is not happening or, or it doesn't happen. So continue to use your voice and speak your truth and continue to educate yourself. And um, just, I would encourage you all, and I'm not saying that this is the case, but I find it a lot with the youth. Don't be a, a problem seeker and complainer only. Also seek to be a solution seeker and solution creator. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you all are the future and we're, we're not here. I'm definitely not here saying that police officers are perfect. <laughs> I will tell you in a second that we're not perfect. We're human beings. We make mistakes. And like Sergeant said, you have bad apples in here that that it's, it's hard to detect and get out. But you know, and it, it's not a it's not a one time one day uh, process. It it takes a while. So just continue to you know do what you do and uh and be be agents of change. Sergeant, did you want to add anything? We just have um, a few minutes. I want to make just, sure that I let the. I I just wanted to add that. Some of you know the the relationships they were talking about. That I think Shanice was saying she just wasn't comfortable around cops, didn't didn't feel that way. I would just want to know that when you were in high school, was there a school resource officer in your school, and did you have any relationship with that officer? No, I can't answer that question because I didn't go to high school. I was homeschooled. I'm referring to being out in public just daily interaction right. with seeing police officers on every corner yeah and, and in the for nicole and gabrielle would you guys have a school resource officer in your school that you guys had any kind of relationship with well my school um did have a resource officer and he i didn't have a personal relationship with him but he was around um i think the the difference for my school is it was a predominantly white school and a black officer. So the, you saw it was easier, kind of easier in a sense for us, like for any person of color to talk to him. But I don't know about how like the white kids necessarily felt. So Sergeant Jacques, do you have a, a last comment? Because I wanna make sure that I allow the youth to sort of talk about the work that they're doing. Yeah, I, I, I just wanna add that I, I understand where Shanice is coming from. And I, I mean, I understand it more now. I didn't know she was homeschooled. So her chances for having a relationship with the police department probably a lot less than everybody else. Uh, I can't tell you that I don't feel the same way. when I, I've, I've been on traffic stops and I'm not in uniform and it is a feeling. It, it is an interesting feeling and it's not pleasant. So I don't think you're uh, unusual for that. But I can just say that um, there's probably much more cops that are good people than the ones that are blasted on the TV for doing wrong. And they got to be held accountable. And uh, last thing I want to say is what Nicole was saying, well, we got to process these bad cops quicker. Um, yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but at the end of the day, they're still citizens and the process doesn't change for them. So for um, Gabriella, Shanice, uh, Nicole, and James Lee, Mabel mentioned in the beginning of, of this webinar that all of you are really just amazing and impressed. I, I mentioned the other day that I feel like an underachiever when I hear about all that you all are doing and the way that you're impacting your communities and the effort that you're making to empower yourselves and also people of color um, and your, your leaders. 
And so I wanted to give you an opportunity just to talk a little bit, um, just like 30 seconds, like the major thing that you feel like you're doing that really is um, activism um, and that is empowering, you think, to people of color. If you can pick one thing that you're doing and, and, and share that, um, because I think it's important for other, other um, young people to hear. Um, so let's start with you, Shanice. Um, okay, I guess the biggest example I could give is that I'm the founder and lead organizer of the Florida Changemaker Summit, which is an annual free one day event for South Florida youth to learn the basics of activism, community organizing and implementing solutions for community issues. So our summit last year was 100% teen led and teen organized. And we had different workshops um, about the school to prison pipeline about um, self-care for youth activists. We have the ACLU come out and explain the Know Your Rights session. Um, we talked about LGBTQ matters. We talked about a lot of different things. And it was um, the first time for a lot of young people within the South Florida area that they had a space to talk about social and political issues and didn't feel like their voice was important. Awesome. Um, Gabriella? Um, well, I co-founded the Black Talent Pipeline Initiative, which is an organization that exists to address the gap between undergraduates and alumni through personalized mentorship pairings, career development, and cultural competent education. Um, and one of our main focuses, especially this year, is financial and interpersonal empowerment because of the existing like um, gaps in education for like minorities, especially black people, and then how capitalism is just not really set up for a lot of black people to succeed financially. We launched Money Goals, which is a free 12 month financial literacy program that covers everything from starting your own business to understanding how to file taxes and how to comprehend your W-2. So we're really um, like excited about that and really excited to be giving the necessary financial knowledge to the black community that we don't really get to have. Awesome. Uh, Nicole and then James Lee. Um, I just graduated high school and I was a part of a lot of youth action teams that help promote mental health and start conversations and dialogue um, from anything on race to drug prevention, all kinds of stuff. Recently, I was one of the lead organizers for a sit-in at Wilton Manors after the George Floyd um, incident. So that's just kind of what I've been focusing on and during the summer before I start college. Awesome, James Lee. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. I just, I've mostly been using my art as a form of expression, as a form of activism. And so, you know, through the different avenues and the, the different series that I've created, I've tried to focus, center like blackness and black culture, as well as black healing and black joy in my work, just as a form of creating what I felt I didn't see in any or needed when I was younger. And so that's what I do most of all been a part of other youth organizations that have impact, impacted my community as well as, you know, impacted my, my student community as well as the community at large. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing what you're doing. Thank you, Officer McCray, Sergeant Jacques. I really appreciate your time. This was a tough conversation. Um, it's never going to be easy. Um, this is where this is where we are. But um, I'm also I also think it's important that all of you are doing so much in your communities. You all are thought leaders, which is really important, and that also impacts change. Officer McRae, I want to make sure that I check in with Mabel um, before I I say anything. Do we have time for Officer Mabel to make a comment? I'm uh, sorry. Officer McCray to make a comment, or do you want to go into questions? Um, it's not long. It's, it's literally thirty seconds. Go for it. No, I, I just okay. want to. Um, I just want to extend the invitation to continue this dialogue because at the end of the day, you can't develop strong relationships and solve problems if you don't communicate. So I know you know everyone has strong opinions on what they believe, but at the end of the day, at least I know with Fort Lauderdale Police Department, our uh, community engagement team. Our mission is to to basically bridge the gap, is to build solidarity and harmony with the with the community, and we can't do that without having uncomfortable conversations. So, if Mabel wants to share my email with all the youth panelists on here, so that we can you we can meet up or we can have conversation, and I can allow you to meet some of my other uh, coworkers, let's do it. 
Awesome. Um, I, I want to personally say thank you to every panelist on here. I know we all feel very passionate about what we're sharing. And I also appreciate the respect that we've been able to all give each other during the panel. Um, after the panel, for those that did register through um, the United Way website on the Zoom link, we will be following up with resources. <laughs> Within that email, I will share Officer McCray's email address with, with everybody as well. Um, for those that are tuning in on YouTube, um, I will have somebody put in the comment box uh, my email address um, so that you could email me directly and I'll share the resources as well. Um, with that being said, I'm just going to go over, take a couple of questions because at the end of the, the chat, I do want to um, share some resources that are not only local, but for, for teens essentially anywhere. So I'm going to start with... Um, Let's see, one of the students asked, how can we participate in the events that youth are hosting and are in charge of? I don't know if that's specifically to possibly Shanice and, and Gabriella, I think, or overall, but if, Shanice, if you'd like to um, speak to that question, please. Um, well, I mean, since COVID, like the this year's summit was postponed, so I don't have any information to give on how you can sign up right now because that's still, you know, being developed. So yeah, but um, we are on social media as at FL Changemakers on all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you. Gabriella, would you like to add on to that or anyone else? Um, yeah, sorry, Gabby. Um, but something that we should definitely be looking into is like local organizations that are doing this work and have continued to do this work to ensure that our youth are engaged and our youth are informed on the issues within our community. And one such organization that I definitely would like to offer up is Dream, Def Dream Defenders because they've been doing a lot of work locally and they've also been doing a lot of, um, they've been doing if I'm not mistaken, Facebook Lives every Sunday, and, and it's called Sunday School, and they basically talk about the issues going on in the community, and they, and they explain about some of the things that have been going on and how and what we can do to assist and help the individuals within our communities in mutual aid programs as well. And so, you know, if you want to continue to stay informed, you should definitely be looking at Dream Defenders, and, you know, and they're based in Miami, and they have a Broward chapter as well. I just wanted to say that if you're looking to get into any type of youth action teams, you should um, go to your school and you can go to your guidance counselors, your administrators, any teachers and ask for a list of clubs. Every school should have a list of all the clubs and organizations that have there. This goes for university as well. And if you don't see something, you can always start something. Like starting a club sounds like it's not, like it's hard. I did it in high school. And it's honestly, if you don't, if you don't see something that you wanna see, be the change inside of yourself. Definitely echoing what the other panelists have already said, um, starting local within your own community is a great way to get involved and especially to meet other like-minded individuals who are really passionate about the same issues or could like point you to other resources or issues that you didn't really know about. Um, you could start right here with BYC. Um, you could come to the Youth Leadership Institute, which is gonna be, I believe, July 22nd and 23rd through Zoom. And if you're particularly interested in joining the Black Talent Pipeline Initiatives um, financial program, which is completely free for a year. Um, I dropped the email, which is princetonbtpi at gmail.com in the chat. And feel free to send us an email so that we can have your email address to send it to our partner, who is Reese Financial Services, and then we can give you access to the platform. Thank you. Now, this question is actually for um, either Sergeant Jacques or Officer McCray or both of you. What programs exist within Broward, uh, Broward's law enforcement agencies to further contact between civilians and police officers with regards to communication and actual in-person acquaintance? Which to me basically means what, sir, what programs do you have within the community that you're actually involved with, with the community? I know, um, good. I was just gonna say, I, I know from being on the community engagement team, um, you know, we're, we're everywhere. We, on a on a almost daily basis, especially before COVID, we were um, going to the Urban League, meeting with the kids there. We were going to Pace Center for Girls. Um, me and my partner recently started a, a chess program at AMI Kids um, to pretty much be, uh, bridge the gap there. We're in the different summer camps. We we met with kids yesterday at uh, Carter Park at the summer camp. So 
I mean, we're pretty much everywhere. And, and I, I, I'm not playing when I say that, that we really want to bridge the gap between um, police and youth and, and give each other an opportunity to see things through each other's lens so that we can have mutual understanding. Um, and I mean, as far as channels, it, it, it really only takes just reaching out to us. Um, like I said, my email is available and, and we can make things happen. And we have an Explorer program as well. Yeah, we do. And and seeing that most of you are going to be over 18 soon, one of the things that we do here at Fort Lauderdale, we have a community policing academy. So what, it, I mean, excuse me, Citizens Police Academy. And we bring people in from the community because sometimes it's, it's really just about an understanding of how we do policing versus if somebody else, another department does policing and how something simple as you call because you had a burglary to your house, you've been waiting for two hours and you saw cops go by to another house down the block while not knowing that that burglary is in progress versus a delayed burglary. So we bring people in and it's an academy and they think they do it like, they still do it about three times a year. And I find that to be very effective because like somebody like Shanice who says, I've, I've never had a lot of contact with the police. I'm not comfortable with the police. I would invite you to come to that and you would get a different look at what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Because a lot of times some things we do that are so basic to us it's not basic to the people on the street. It's not basic to the community. And if we don't continue to bridge that gap, then you're not gonna ever become any anywhere comfortable with the police. And yet we're gonna still be policing your community. So um, what, what McCray's saying is actually true. We really wanna bridge that gap because at the end of the day, it makes our job a lot easier. You know, um, trust me, I'm I'm a I'm treated differently in this uniform, and when I'm not in this uniform, I'm treated a whole different di different way. So, I understand a lot of what Shanice's saying. I I get it. Trust me, I get it. I've been here 31 years. I get it, <laughs> but I still say the community needs to be educated okay. sometime on what we do and the way we do it. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question before I get into um, our, our quick slide of resources because I do want to respect everyone's time and I believe Shanice may have to kind of log off um, in the next minute or so. Um, again, for the officers, if you can answer in 30 seconds or less, um, mm -hmm. how do we report police brutality in the act? What if we call 911 and they just worsen the situation? I don't think you can do really anything different than that because if you if you're videoing something and, and something's going down, I would not tell you if, if if it's bad already. I don't think you getting involved in it to try to help that person. I think nine one one is your best is the best way to go about it. I don't, Johnny may have feel different about that, but you know I'll let him answer that. I, I agree, and, and I also say we have a, a internal um, affairs unit, and their number is on our flpd.org website. So whenever and they handle internal and external complaints so and we're we're actually adding a another sergeant to that unit soon um where the workload is going to be increased they're going to be reviewing body cam uh more often so that's another avenue to take if you have complaints thank you so much i'm going to share um be sharing my screen uh, very quickly with um, a few resources so please bear with me And again, these are resources that are um, not only specific to Broward County, which is in Florida, but also um, overall. I, I do know we have some folks tuning in from outside of Broward, but I thank you for the support as well. So a couple of resources that we have here. Um, first and foremost, activism. We heard overall, all of our panelists um, have different ways of, of being active, whether it's something related to racial equity, or health or or through art. Um, again, Shanice, uh, this is her book, A Young Revolutionary, A Teen's Guide to Activism. Uh, then we have, um, you know, maybe we need somebody to talk to and, and maybe the folks that we live with at home aren't the best people at the moment. Maybe they just won't listen to us. 
Um, Broward has the Teen Space uh, 211. You can find it at teenspace211.org. And it's essentially a website where you can uh, find different resources, chat um, to kind of not only help with your mental health, but also just overall find resources. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Marsha does, uh, uh, she's a director of education for the Florida region of ADL. ADL is a national organization and they focus on a lot of these areas, uh, religious freedom, free speech, race, race and racial justice, criminal justice reform, education equity, women's equity, voting rights, LGBTQ rights, immigrant and refugee rights. So, um, you know, there's something for anything that you, any cause or social issue that you're passionate about. Um, then we have a list of movies related to uh, racial uh, injustice. Many of you have probably either seen these movies or have already come across a list of these movies, but just wanted to reiterate that. Um, and then some Instagram handles, because uh, we know that most teens are on Instagram. So I've included a few um, racial um, justice type of Instagram pages. Um, they are showing up racial justice, color lines, news, the conscious kid, color of change, the NAACP, and the equal justice um, organization. Now for our teens that are either 18 or about to turn 18, um, how else can you be civically engaged? Um, is about simply by voting and being involved, not only with the presidential election, but also what's happening locally in your community, whether it's the school board or your mayor or commissioners. So the primary um, election is August 18th and the general election is November 3rd and elections throughout each county um, vary. Um, United Way Worldwide is uh, partnering when, with When We All Vote um, if you could see the little website there, you can just simply click, um, put that in your search engine and you can go ahead and register right there on the spot to vote. Another way to kind of get a, an overview of who your current elected officials are now, just go on usa.gov backslash elected dash officials and it'll give you different links so you can get to uh, different um, websites related to the House of Representatives, your Senate, your mayor, all of that information. Now the census. Encourage your parents to please complete the census. This is a snapshot of, of what your community will be represented in the government for the next 10 years. It's the way the government figures out how federal funding will be dispersed throughout your community, which affects uh, lunch programs, hospitals, roads, all of that stuff. So please encourage your parents to fill out the census, whether it's through mail, whether it's um, online or through the phone. And then locally, um, the Children's Services Council here in Broward has a booth, uh, I'm sorry, a Broward Youth Cabinet, um, which happens a couple of times a year. And it's a space where youth can receive the necessary tools to advocate for issues they are passionate about. More information can be found if you email youth at csebroward.org. The person in charge of that, his name is Easton Harrison. Um, and it, it essentially is um, a program where youth could learn about their local, state, and federal government um, and then different tools that they can use to help advocate for any social cause that they're passionate about. It's not this has to be specific to racial injustice. So those are just some uh, resources that uh, we wanted to provide to all of our, all of our viewers right now. Um, we will be sharing this um, with our registrants via email. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to, again, give a really big thank you and shout out to all of our panelists. Uh, looks like we had to lose James Lee as well. I think he had somewhere to be. Um, but I do want to thank everybody here, ADL, the City of Fort Lauderdale Police Department, United Way, uh, Broward Youth